We're in Matthew 27 again. I want to pick it up in verse 45 this morning. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. Now from the sixth hour unto the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were, looking, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children. You know, in our culture, many reject Christianity because of the offense of the cross. Paul, in the first century, talks about the offense of the cross. As you're uh, talking to people in this culture and, and, and a culture that is becoming more and more resistant to Christianity, real biblical Christianity, and people will say to you, what, what's all this bloody sacrifice and what's the deal with the cross? And, you know, if God's a loving God, why can't he just forgive everybody? Or why can't he at least forgive those who say they're sorry for their sin? Or why can't he forgive those who are basically good moral people and they haven't committed heinous crimes? You know, I can understand God condemning the child molesters and the murderers and the rapists and the, you know, and, and the drug traffickers and the people involved in you know, human bondage and all of that. But what about the good moral people? Why do we even need a crucifixion? Why do we even need a savior? Can't we do enough good deeds to save ourselves? But what people don't seem to comprehend is what they know and what, what we see even in culture. You know, when there's wrongdoing, it incurs a debt. Why do you instinctively feel when somebody does something wrong to you that they owe you something? You instinctively feel that. You believe that. And sometimes you believe it so strongly it splits families. It ends friendships. And so you feel that, you know, they've incurred some kind of a debt. Even in our culture, we use the language of somebody commits a crime, they have to pay their debt to society. Where does that come from? That comes from the fact that you're created in the image of God. That comes from the fact that you live in a universe created by God with moral principles and moral laws, and no matter how much you try to deny that and rationalize that, you just can't live in a world where there are no moral absolutes, where there are no right and wrong. And so this is the culture we live in. And this is the culture, like the first century, that we are called to proclaim the message of the cross and to not back up on the message of the cross. Because you find people in our culture get very religious around Easter time, and then you have other people who just mock and despise the cross and despise the name of Jesus. Now, last week, as we, sort of, as we began to, to look ahead toward Easter Sunday... And Good Friday, we saw the scream of Jesus that he's been hanging on the cross now from 9 a.m. to till 12 noon, and, and there's been, uh, at 12 noon comes this supernatural darkness. And so from 12 noon to 3 p.m., he hangs in silence and in darkness on the cross. And we saw last week this scream, and that's, we saw that's what the word actually meant in verse 46, a loud voice, a scream. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we said the reason he was forsaken was because he who was the sinless, perfect son of God was bearing the eternal punishment for all men who have ever lived and ever will live. And that's a staggering thought, but he is God, and God the Father, in a way we can't really comprehend, poured out on his own son the, the, the sin debt that we owe. And Jesus suffered 
for our sin. And in the Old Testament, all of those sacrificial lambs taught that principle of substitutionary atonement. Why would I, as a Jewish person who has sinned, then I bring a lamb to the priest and the lamb gets it in the throat for my sin? That doesn't seem fair. But what God was teaching them was this principle of substitutionary atonement of of someone taking the sin debt upon himself, and they were all pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this morning, we're talking about the impact of the cross, and one particular impact of the cross, something staggering happened the moment Jesus died, and that event is recorded in verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, then behold. Now, we read that in the English Bible, and and we're not really getting the gist of it. It's sort of like, wow, look at this. This is amazing. Something incredible happened. Here's what happened. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The moment Jesus died, God ripped apart the veil of the temple. You say, what is so significant about that? And what exactly is the veil of the temple? The temple was preceded by the tabernacle. If you read the Old Testament, you'll find out that God gave Moses a design for a portable temple. It was a tabernacle. And this tabernacle was covered over with animal skins, and it was put up, and it was taken down. And wherever the Jewish people traveled, they took the tabernacle with them. And it was a giant portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the regulations of the sacrifices, the construction of the tabernacle, were all given by God to Moses. It's interesting. There were two chapters. There are two chapters in the Bible devoted to the story of creation. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm like, God, couldn't you have given us a little more information here? Two chapters on the creation of the universe. And yet there are 50-some chapters devoted to the tabernacle. So the tabernacle must have been a pretty important entity in the mind and heart of God. And the tabernacle, we know, preceded the temple. Well, when they got into the land, if you remember, King David wanted to build a temple, a place for God to replace the temporariness of the tabernacle. And God said, no, David, you can't build a temple. You're a man of bloody hands. Your son will build the temple. David gathered a number of materials before he died, but his son Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. And it was a temple, they tell us, of incredible splendor. And it was the pride jewel of the Jewish people. But unfortunately, the Jewish people sinned against God Because of that, God sent, first of all, Assyrians into the northern kingdom, then the Babylonians into the southern kingdom, and eventually Nebuchadnezzar came and the Babylonians destroyed the wall of Jerusalem and literally decimated the temple. And so the temple that is talked about here is not the temple of Solomon. Well, they were in bondage for 70 years, and after the bondage, then they came back, and the exiles rebuilt the temple. But it says in the Bible that the older people who had seen the, older, the other temple wept because it just didn't have the glory. Then a man came along called Herod the Great, and Herod the Great wanted to leave a legacy of himself, and he was a great builder. And so he took that temple in Jerusalem and he rebuilt it again and and made it bigger. This is the temple that was standing when Jesus Christ came in the first century in his ministry. This is the temple that is talked about here. And the Bible says the veil of the temple was torn in two. Now the word here is naos, and, and what it means is the inner sanctuary, the holy of holies that we'll talk about in just a moment. This was the place of atonement prescribed by God. This was the place where God, and and the plan was that God chose one man, Abraham. Out of Abraham, he chose Israel, and Israel was to be a witness to the world. And they were to be a witness to the world of the true God, but they failed in their mission. And so Jesus Christ comes as the promised Messiah. He does all the miracles and everything that that shows he was the Messiah, but he came with a purpose. He came to die. 
And so Jesus suffers and dies on the cross. In those hours of darkness, I believe, he pays the sin debt. And now at the end of the crucifixion, these final cries of Jesus come in quick succession. And the moment he dies, the veil of the temple, what separated the holy place from the most holy place, the holy of holies, was literally ripped in two by the finger of God. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of the tabernacle, at least uh, uh, what we, you know, think of. And you'll notice the tabernacle, there are certain pieces of furniture in the front of it. It was basically divided into three sections. Now, you had the outer court, and you can spend a whole series of messages on teaching from the tabernacle, and we've done that at different times. The tabernacle was supposed to teach the people of Israel that that God was separate, that God was holy, that you don't just rush into the presence of God. In fact, you can't even come into the presence of God in the Old Testament, and we'll see that as you look at the tabernacle. The people would come to the, the door of the outer court, and then the priest at the brazen altar would take their sacrifices. Then they would go into this first part where you see the candlestick and the table of showbread, and, and then there was a partition. And the partition was the veil of the uh, here. And it was a veil, a curtain, and God prescribed the colors and everything. These are all types of Jesus Christ. And then inside that veil was the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies had one piece of furniture. It was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was simply a wooden box overlaid with gold, about three feet nine inches long, two feet three inches wide, and two feet high. But the top of the Ark was covered by a solid gold piece. And out of that solid gold piece, God had uh, created a man uh, and men that could fashion two cherubim right out of the top of of what was called the mercy seat, the top of the Ark of of the Covenant, the lid. And these cherubim would look down on the middle, and this was where the high priest, only once a year, only on the Day of Atonement, would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would take the blood, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and it would provide atonement for the people of Israel for one year. The priest could go into the first part, Only the high priest could go in once a year, and there's so much more teaching on that. But that's what I want you to comprehend in your mind. Now, when Herod rebuilt the temple, the Ark of the Covenant had been lost during the Babylonian invasion. Now, those of you that have seen Indiana Jones know it's in a warehouse in Washington, D.C., but uh, no, that's not where it is. We don't know where it is, and it was lost. You say, well, what was in the Holy of Holies in Herod's temple? Nothing. Uh, Some traditions say there was a foundation stone where the Ark of the Covenant should sit. But still, they went through the ritual of the high priest going in there, and they tell us in tradition they would sprinkle blood on the foundation stone because the Ark of the Covenant had been lost. This was a picture of the atonement that was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. See, the tabernacle and then the temple, which was built after the pattern of the tabernacle, was to be a picture of Jesus Christ. Man, see, we are sinful. God is holy. And that that wall of partition was showing that separation. Something has to happen with our sin in order for us to come into fellowship with a holy God. And that's what God was teaching symbolically and through pictures in the tabernacle and later in the temple. Hebrews tells us this, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. In other words, those sacrifices could not change the heart of the worshiper. Say, how were people saved in the Old Testament? By works? No. Paul points out very clearly in Romans 4, the time of Abraham, the time of David, all people are saved by faith. In what? In the promise of God sending a Redeemer all the way back to Genesis 3.15. Now, the revelation of that was progressive through the Old Testament, and Abraham didn't comprehend all of that, but he believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. David, in the same way, trusted in the message of God. 
God. Now, the sacrifices were something they did in obedience, which was an expression of their faith, but it didn't save them. But it allowed God not to condemn them to cover their sin because of the principle of substitutionary atonement. The fact that a, a lamb and a, or a goat was killed for them, and it was all a picture of when Jesus Christ would come. And so, the tearing of the veil was very symbolic. The tearing of the veil symbolized the tearing of Jesus' flesh upon the cross. You say, where in the world do you get that? I get that from Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer in in the book of Hebrews is about going from the shadows of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament to the substance of Jesus, that they all pointed to Christ. And and I went through a couple years ago, verse by verse, the book of Hebrews. And, And the whole book of Hebrews is showing how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the types of the tabernacle and the temple and the sacrificial system. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. If we had time this morning, we could look at the colors, the construction of that veil, and we would see that it was all a picture of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ had to die. He he had to come. He came as the God-man. Now, he suffered spiritually for our sin in those hours of darkness, but he physically suffered and he physically died because to show us that's the only way you can approach a holy God. John MacArthur says, as long as his flesh was alive, it was a barrier in the sense that only by its sacrifice could men's sins be atoned for and the way to heaven open. In a sense, that holy of holies in a certain way, depicted heaven. It was the place where God manifests His presence. And there in in the Old Testament, the Shekinah glory would come down, and and it would sort of be a visible illustration of the presence of God. And it shows us that man cannot just approach God on his own means. Now, this shows us something else. The writer of Hebrews says, the veil represented Jesus' flesh, which was torn. Now, what's that mean? Well, there's a lot of people in churches this morning, you know what they're being taught? Emulate the Sermon on the Mount. Follow the example of Jesus' life, and you may, hopefully, if you do enough good works, get to heaven. But do you understand the tearing of the veil? The moment Jesus died, and the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says it was representative of his flesh. What that teaches us is this. You cannot get to heaven by imitating the life of Jesus. See, some people want to deny his, his deity or, or, or the sufficiency of his sacrifice. And so they will tell you, well, you read the Sermon on the Mount. You follow Jesus. You take those principles and you follow his life. And, and that will make you a better person. And that will make you acceptable to God. Then why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus have to die? We said last week that the writers of the Gospels give so much attention and time uh, to to the death and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but why did Jesus die? Can you answer that question? Why did Jesus die? What does the crucifixion mean? And that's what we're talking about in these messages. It was His death that makes the way into heaven possible for sinners. The veil was not torn until Jesus died. It was the moment he died that the veil was ripped in two. Very soon after Jesus' scream of despair, remember, he hung on the cross for three hours in darkness and silence, and then the the darkness and the silence is pierced by this scream of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Very soon after that, John 19 tells us, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now, a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. See, 
Often what happens when a person dies, their spirit leaves their body and they bow their head. Jesus bowed his head first, showing again that no man took his life, that he, he dismissed his spirit because he is God. Now, did he physically die? Yes, he did, absolutely. But his death was like no other person's death because no one has the power over the spirit in the day of their death. We saw that last week in the Bible, except Jesus Christ. And so... After his scream, he said, I thirst. And then he said, it is finished. The word finished is a very important word, telestai. It was used in Greek of an artist who would finish a, a, a masterpiece or a work of art. It was used of a judge who would finally give the final ruling. Archaeologists have uncovered papyri receipts for taxes that's interesting this time of year. And the word telestai written across them said, paid in full. Jesus didn't say, I am finished. Jesus said, it's finished. It's completed. It's paid in full, meaning the work of redemption was now accomplished for all men who would trust in him as their savior. So the tearing of the veil symbolized the finality the sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross. Finality, sufficiency. You say, what do you mean by sufficiency? The death of Jesus Christ on the cross, cross then his burial and his resurrection is the gospel. That is sufficient to save any person who has ever lived. Now, in the Old Testament, they were saved by faith looking forward to the cross. We have the greater responsibility now because we have the whole story written down for us. So we look back to the cross, but yet we look to a risen Savior, not a dead Savior, not a Savior stuck up on a cross. We worship Jesus, and we don't worship the cross. That was that Christian movie came out a while back, Do You Believe? And, and, and one of the things that irritated me about it was they were saying, Do you believe in the cross? No, I believe in Jesus. I believe the cross is a historical event, but I don't believe in the cross. I believe in Jesus. I don't pray to the cross. I pray to Jesus. I pray to God in the name of Jesus. Nothing more can be added. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, it talks about the mercy seat. And the word that is used there is the word for propitiation. Now, propitiation is one of those theological words, but understand propitiation as satisfaction. You say, what was satisfied with the death of Jesus? Why did Jesus have to die and suffer on the cross? Because God is a holy and a just God. Because sin incurs a debt, and I have a debt of sin that has to be paid. And Jesus Christ paid the debt for me. He is the perfect helpless lamb. Jesus allowed himself. He went willingly to the cross. He was the sinless and is the sinless, perfect son of God. And so he died in my place. He took the punishment I deserve. And if you reject that kind of love, there's no hope eternally for anyone. God's righteous wrath and judgment for sin was satisfied by the death of Christ. The reason I know if I die, I'm going to heaven is not because I'm a pastor, not because I've been baptized, not because I'm in church all the time, not because I try to live right, because I don't live perfectly. Nobody does. But I know my sins were paid for. I know the debt is paid. I know that Jesus paid it, and it's finished, and it's completed, because I'm not trusting in myself. I'm trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for me. 1 John 2, 2 says, He himself is the propitiation for our sins, satisfaction, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Now, what does that mean? And I don't want to be offensive to some of you coming out of other traditions, but try to think. Use a little logic here. What that means is there is no more need for sacrifices. When we have communion, we are not re-sacrificing Jesus. We are celebrating the fact that it's finished. That means there's no more need for temples. There's no more need for priesthoods. I'm not a priest. You don't need a man to intercede to God for you. Why? Because the Bible says there's only one intercessor. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. 
Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Talking about the Old Testament priests, which can never take away sins. But this man, meaning Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he is perfected forever. Those are being sacrificed. Those are being sanctified. One sacrifice for sins forever. Do you know in the tabernacle and later in the temple there were no seats? Why? Because the priest's work was never done. They were continually active. What did Jesus do? After he showed himself alive, he ascended to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Why? To show the work of redemption was completed. And that's why God ripped the veil in two. Historians tell us the veil was so massive that for it to be ripped from top to bottom, it had to be the work of God. Now, there's this uh, tradition, there was this mantelpiece, and then with the earthquake, the mantelpiece fell, and it ripped the veil. That's just ridiculous. That's man again trying to deny the obvious. And for the Jewish priests, they saw that veil ripped in two. They knew that had to be a supernatural work of God, but because of their stubbornness and their willfulness, they continued to do the sacrifices, even though God had demonstrated there was no need for it. Luke's gospel records Jesus' final words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, what's happening today? Here's what's happening today. Religion continually attempts to reconstruct the veil. That's what's happening today. You look at all these human religions. See, I don't believe in religion. I believe in New Testament biblical Christianity based on the revelation of the Old Testament. And biblical Christianity says the only thing you need to do to get to, to God is to confess the fact that you're a sinner, bow your knee to Jesus Christ, acknowledge He is Lord and Savior, that He has done everything for you, repent of your sin and turn to God and He will save you based on what Jesus Christ has done, not what you have done. What does religion teach? You've got to do some kind of activity. You've got to do some kind of formality. You've got, to, you've got to continually do something to earn your way to God. What are they doing? They're trying to put the veil back up. They're trying to say, you don't have access to God. Jesus Christ's sacrifice is not sufficient. And folks, this is a big deal. This is the difference between heaven and hell for most people. Because people go to churches and they hear all this religiosity and all this formality and all this confusion when the gospel, Paul said, you're getting away from the simplicity of Jesus. Why did Jesus die? Why was the temple veil ripped in two? Because the way of access is made available to God. First Timothy 2, there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You're logical people. You're smart people. Use your mind. Who is going to intercede between God and man? Can a man do that? How about someone who is both God and man? How about the only person in all of history who is God and man? Jesus Christ. That's why he's the only mediator. The Old Testament priests were ordained by God because they were needed at that time to provide the, in, the intermediary access to God, not through them, but through the sacrificial system that pointed to Jesus. But once Jesus died and he declared the work of redemption is finished, then the God ripped the veil in two. Don't let some man or some religious professional tell you that the veil is back up, that you've got to do something else to get to God. God himself made a statement when he ripped the veil in two. That's why Hebrews says, seeing we have a high, great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with, with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may find and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What is God saying? The way of access is clear. 
Right now, wherever I am, I can bow my head and I can have access to God because of Jesus Christ. I do not need a human priest to intercede for me. I don't need a cleric. I don't need a preacher. I don't need a bishop. I don't need anybody because the way of access is made. My intermediary, my mediator is Jesus Christ because he paid the debt. And then he died, and then he rose from the dead, and then he proved he was alive, and then he ascended to heaven, and then he sat down at the right hand of God, and he's constantly making intercession for me. Now, if you don't believe that, read your Bible. You can either believe what somebody, and don't take my word for it. Read the Bible. See what the Bible says. Do you know how God put his stamp of finality on this whole thing? In 70 A.D., God allowed the Romans under Titus to come and obliterate the temple one more time. And it has never been rebuilt. Now, we believe at one time it will be rebuilt because of God's purposes with Israel in the tribulation. But that's another message. But God, the priest would not stop the sacrifice. So God said, y'all stop the sacrifices. He let Titus come in and he decimated the temple. And so they have not had, in fact, Hosea chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 said that's what would happen. And they would dwell without a priesthood and without sacrifices until the latter days. That there's, the temple's going to be rebuilt. We may not see it in our lifetime, but it will be rebuilt. That doesn't mean that God approves of sacrifices that has a prophetic significance. The death of Jesus made the way to heaven open, which is really interesting. So now a Christian's death brings them into the presence of God. You see, because I've trusted Christ as my Savior, and I don't need somebody to intercede for me because I've got the mediator, the, the crucified, buried, risen, ascended Jesus. He's my mediator. He's the one who is my advocate before the Father in heaven. And so when I die, now my death will bring me actually into the presence of God. I can come into his presence now through prayer and through worship, but I can actually physically will one day come into his presence, either through death or through the rapture. Because of Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The torn veil stands as a witness against anybody who will teach you that you have to work your way to heaven. The torn veil stands as a witness and the destruction of the temple as a witness that, that you, God will accept you on, based on faith in Jesus Christ and faith alone. And you don't need baptism and you don't need some kind of work and you don't need some kind of formality or, or religious this or that. Think that through. Why did Jesus die? Why did he suffer? Why did he say it's finished, paid in full? To be saved, you must come to God pleading no righteousness of your own and trusting in Jesus' payment for your sin. Do you know what the cross means? Do you know what the crucifixion stands for? Do you know why Jesus died? Why did God rip the veil of the temple in two? Why did the finger of God rip that massive veil from top to bottom the very moment Jesus died? Because God was making a, an eternal statement. And he, and he put the, the final point on it when he destroyed the temple through Titus. There's no need for priests. There's no need for sacrifices. We do not re-sacrifice Jesus in the communion service. We celebrate it is finished, paid in full. Father, I pray for so many that are under this false delusion that they need a priest to get them to heaven. They need a, some kind of religious formality. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because Christ paid it all. My sin debt is paid in full. But I have to acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I have to confess Christ as the one and only sufficient sacrifice for my sin. And when I believe that and I commit my eternity to him, then one day when I die, 
I will be ushered into the very presence of God because Jesus Christ, my high priest, has passed into the heavens. He shed his own blood. He is the substitutionary sacrifice for my sin. And I pray every person in here that has gripped their heart because if it hasn't changed their life, it's not gripped their heart. And I pray that they would turn to Christ and turn away from man-made religion and formality. They would trust in the only person that can save their eternal soul. And we thank you for what you've done for us. We will never get over for all of eternity the price you paid so that we can enjoy fellowship with you. And we thank you for it and we praise you for it. And in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being in church today. Tonight we'll be going back to the book of Habakkuk.